back with you this morning. Uh, if this is your first time visiting us, welcome. And uh, my name is Rick Bonifield, and I usually typically preach here on Sunday mornings. We are starting a new series called Share. And I truly believe that if you follow these five messages, that your 2018 year will be incredibly, radically different than last year. And it will be a, a better different. Um, so, so hopefully uh, we can uh, iron through some, some good ideas and the Word of God over the next five weeks as we talk about what it means to share. Well, obviously, every person in this room probably has New Year resolutions. Maybe you have one, maybe you have two. I bet everybody in this uh, 2018 wants to eat uh, better than they did last year. And so I figured one of the best sermons that we could talk about to kick off 2018 was this encouragement for everybody in this room to have a goal, and that's for you to eat in 2018. And I want you to eat once a quarter, and that's what this message is going to be about. So please don't throw any stones at me. I don't care what you eat. Maybe you eat vegetables. Maybe you eat pie. But I want to encourage you to eat. I absolutely ate for the last two weeks. I was on vacation during Christmas time. I took a nap every day. It was awesome. It's like that's the climax of adult lifestyle when you rejoice about taking a nap at least once a day. So I was watching my daughter Piper. She went down for a nap. I went down for a nap. And it was fantastic. And I actually looked at myself in the mirror this morning, and I kind of was caught off guard because I was scared because I thought I saw somebody else. My face is all swollen. I've gained like 15 pounds in three months. It's horrible. So hopefully I can eat a little bit better this year, but uh, my clothes are fitting a little bit tighter. And so as I go through this message, when I think about eating, I'm thinking about vegetables, if you know what I mean. I'm winking to this side, by the way. You can't see that. But yeah, I totally need to eat better. And so Jesus actually wants us to eat with each other. And specifically, Jesus in scripture would eat with sinners, people that, people that were looked upon by the Pharisees as the rejects of society. And my poor little daughter, man, she takes right after her daddy when it comes to eating. Angel and I made some Christmas cookies this year. And uh, actually, when I say Angel and I, I mean Angel and I ate them. And she made these sugar cookies with M&Ms in them. And so we had them up on the counter, and one of the things that we bought for Piper was this stool that she could actually pull, and she'll drag it across the kitchen, and she'll put it up to the island, get it all straight, and then she'll climb up, and she'll stand there, and she'll be able to do stuff with us. It's really, really cool. It was Angel's idea. And so we made these cookies, and, you know, we're watching TV, we're doing stuff around the house, and, I mean, we're just really not paying attention to our daughter, right? We got the gate closed. It's, it's freedom. And so... Uh, next thing I know, we're, we're making cookies, Angel and I are running around the house doing something, and I come out to the kitchen, and I see my daughter standing up at the counter, double-fisted with cookies. <laughs> and any time that I see her, and I'm like, she's not doing something that she should do, I'm like, Piper, what are you doing? And instantly, Piper goes, num, num. And she's just, <laughs> she's just standing there with those two cookies, and I'm like, ah, oh, she looks, she took after me, you know what I mean, just like her daddy. But Piper is so funny. Anytime we're eating something, she could just eat a meal. And even if she's full, she'll want to come and share and exactly what we have. And there's something special about sharing a meal with people. In the first century, sharing a meal with somebody was one of the most intimate things that you could do. It meant that I accept you. I am one with you. And so, you know, we share a meal today at a fast food restaurant. We're in and out. But a meal in the first century was an experience. And so we find Jesus in Luke chapter 15 having a meal with a group of people, and he is looked down upon by the religious elite, by those who are uh, religiously superior to everyone else. And so I'd like for you to turn to Luke chapter 15. We're going we're gonna to go through verses 1 through 7 this morning, and I hope that you walk away this morning determined to eat with each other. It says in verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 1, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. We find this throughout scripture. Jesus spending time with people known as tax collectors or sinners. And a tax collector in the, in the first century under Jesus' time, they were considered people who were traitors to Jewish society. Basically, Rome represented this symbolism of the Jews being uh, lesser than everyone else. They were subjugated. They were inferior. And so to be on the side of the Romans meant to betray Jewish superiority. And so not only if you were a tax collector were you hated, but you were the scum of the earth if you were a Jewish tax collector. 
One of the reasons why they hated the tax collectors is because they would not only take a portion that they were due to the Roman government, but then they would also sometimes take four, five, ten times as much as what they actually were supposed to do. And so they were thieves. And they were hated by the Jewish society. And to be called a tax collector, even if you were not called a tax collector, was one of the worst insults that you could ever have. They also uh, called these, these people sinners. Now, a sinner wasn't necessarily somebody who was just a regular person like you or, all, you or I. But the Pharisees and the scribes, they developed this way of lifestyle that was above and beyond God's word, right? And so if you could think of it like this. They had this writing that they actually still have today, the Halakha. And what the Halakha does is it describes a certain ritual, a certain lifestyle, a certain thing that you should do, even though it's not necessarily found in the Bible. It would be like if Christians today wrote a book of principles and teachings and sayings that you should absolutely follow, even though it's not actually written in the Bible. And what they would do is they would look out at society and they would judge people if you weren't living according to their extra biblical teachings. You would be called a sinner. But if you were a Pharisee, if you were a scribe, and you followed not only the word of God to the T, but then you also followed these traditions, these sayings, oh, you were a righteous person. And so they looked at everyone who didn't do life the way that they did it. They looked at them as a sinner. And here we have Jesus eating and fellowshipping with what's considered the scum of the earth, the lowest of the low, the people who are socially outcast, the people who have been banned from the temple. I mean, you would not want to be caught in the same room as this type of individual. But here is Jesus eating with sinners, people who don't deserve to even be fellowshiped with. And so the Pharisees, unfortunately, they had this misconception that they based their standing with God on their rituals and their laws and their external appearance rather than discovering the heart of God and having a relationship with him. And so they looked at this guy named Jesus, the Messiah, the perfect one, and they said, ah, this guy isn't the Messiah. He is a friend of sinners. These people who have been outcast, Jesus embraces. And so we find in Luke chapter 15, verse 2, Look at what happens once Jesus decides to eat with sinners. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners, and he eats with them. These Pharisees and scribes were among the Jewish elite. They were the leadership at this time. And Jesus, like I said, had developed this reputation of spending time with tax collectors and sinners. Over and over again in Scripture, we find Jesus fellowshipping with tax collectors and sinners, people who are the scum of the earth. Every once in a while, Jesus would also fellowship with the Pharisees. He would use this as a teaching opportunity because the Pharisees recognized that Jesus taught like no one else taught. He lived like no one else lived. He did what no one else can do. There was something special about this guy, but yet why is he fellowshipping with all of these dirty, low-life people? I mean, doesn't Jesus get it? Isn't he supposed to be the elite and the best of the best? Why is he eating with somebody like that? Why is he ministering to somebody like that? There was one particular story where Jesus was fellowshipping with the Pharisees, the religious elite, and in came a woman. She was a terrible person by their standards. In fact, she was so low and she was so uh, humiliated that when she entered into this room where Jesus was with the Pharisees, she was so overwhelmed by her grief and her sorrow that she began to cry and she began to wash Jesus' feet with her tears in her hair. Ladies, can you imagine doing something like that? Washing somebody's dirty feet? with your hair and with your tears? And the Pharisees looked and they said, why is Jesus letting this unclean woman touch him? Why is he even associating himself with somebody like that? But that's the type of reputation that Jesus built for himself. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 19, we find this. Jesus said, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at this glutton, look at this drunkard, a friend of the tax collectors and the sinners. But wisdom is vindicated by her actions. What does that mean? What does it mean that Jesus spent time with the lowly, with the outcast, but it was a wise thing to do? We're going to get to that here in a little bit. We also find in Matthew chapter 9, verse 11, Luke chapter 5, verse 20, the Pharisees asked the disciples of Jesus, why does your teacher eat with the tax collectors and the sinners? And that's the question that we want to answer this morning. Why should you eat with a sinner? Why should you eat with the lowest of the low? Why should you eat with the outcasts of society? Why should you spend your time ministering to the untouchables, the people that no one wants to minister to? 
the homeless, the needy, the hungry, the prostitutes, the broken? Why did Jesus eat with sinners and why should we? Well, Jesus answers the question for us in Luke chapter 15, verse 3. Look at Jesus' response. He told them a parable. Verse 4, what man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and he's lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and he rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors and he says to them, rejoice with me for I have found my lost sheep. You see, Jesus uses this parable to illustrate the own hypocrisy and inconsistency of the Pharisees. He says, which man of you, if you were in my situation and you had lost a sheep, would not leave the 99 and go rescue the one? Which one of you would make this decision? Which one of you would say, nah, it's lost, just let it go? None of you would. And so Jesus answers their question through this powerful parable. And it would, be like, it would be like saying this. Which parent in here would not fight for the health and safety and security of a child that's wandered away from the faith? Which one of you would say, well, my son's addicted to drugs. Well, my daughter has just gone off the deep end. I'm just going to write her off. I'm going to let her go. She's dead to me. For those of you who are parents, you you experience this deep struggle in your heart. Maybe some of you have lost your children. Maybe some of you have had children that have left the faith, and you find this extreme tension in your own heart saying, I just can't give up on my own family. I can't turn my back on my own son and my daughter. I may not agree with their lifestyle. I may not understand their choices that they make, but my arms are always open because they're my child. Or if you think of it like this, if you had a friend, for instance, students that were at school, which one of you would say, because my friend is depressed and suicidal, I'm giving up on them? Because they don't believe in Jesus, I turn my back on them. I don't think anybody would really do that, would we? What about for those of you who are more spiritually mature and those who really get the Christian faith? Which one of you, if you had children or students in your youth group who liked a different music style or maybe wanted a different church tradition or had a different building design or outreach strategy, which mature member in Christ would say, because they do things differently, they don't belong here? None of us would. And so Jesus gives us this illustration. Which one of you would lose something and not fight to get it back? And that's exactly what I'm doing. Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, because of your traditions, you have destroyed the authority of God's word. And that's what this lifestyle book was. This way of living, these traditions that they had, they built it up in such a way that they looked at everyone else and they said, you're a sinner and I'm righteous because I go above and beyond. And Jesus says, it is those very traditions that has nullified the word of God. And we as Christians must speak where the Bible speaks. We must follow what God's word says. And when we come to things that we disagree on, we must give charity and liberty. It is very, very important for us as Christians not to nullify God's word because of our perceptions, our wants, and our desires. And Jesus says, Pharisees, you've lost the heart of God because you've got distracted by these extra laws and these extra teachings. That's why you're not fellowshipping with sinners, and I am. Because you've missed something. You've missed the heart of God. Yes, God is just. Yes, God is holy. Yes, God hates sin and will punish it. But also God is grace and love and mercy. And if you don't have a balance of the two, you've got a misconception of who God is. And that will fulfill itself out in what you choose to do and how you think about God and about life. You see, Jesus says this. I've come to save the sick. I've come to seek the lost and find them. And if there's one that goes astray, I will leave the 99 and I will find the one. He says in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, I tell you in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And man, he really speaks this powerful truth to the Pharisees in this moment. You guys think that you're righteous, but you've missed the whole point of the word of God and a lifestyle in following him. It is to seek and save the lost. And Jesus validates himself in this moment. He says, this is my mission. This is my mission to reflect God's heart and God's law. He kept the law flawlessly, but he also sought to seek and save the lost. And so the purpose of Jesus' eating with sinners is not recreation. It is not just to spend time having fun, but it is repentance. It's not just to go out and say, yeah, I just have friends. 
but it's to spend time with your worldly friends for a purpose, to lead them to repentance, to have a relationship with God. The Gospels cover different stories, and sometimes they have a harmony. They'll cover the same story from a different angle. And when we take all of the stories together, we can see the big picture. And so Matthew actually records the same story in Matthew chapter 9, and he records Jesus saying this, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but it is the sick. And he actually quotes Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, where he says, God desires mercy and not sacrifice. And that's what the Pharisees missed. That's what they failed to understand. They failed to understand mercy. Not giving someone what they absolutely deserve. And you know what the truth is? I am a sinner. And so are you. And none of us deserve God's grace. None of us deserves God's love. None of us deserve to be taken care of. Food in our bellies, clothes on our back, a wonderful church building to fellowship and worship in, cars that we can drive, people that we can love and hug and kiss and go home to. None of us deserve that. We are all sinners. We've all made mistakes. We've all trespassed against God. But yet God has given us mercy. And Jesus is saying this is the heart and the mission of God, to seek and save those who are lost. And how does he do that? How does he accomplish that purpose? He spends time eating with them. And so what an encouragement we can have walking away here today. If I can eat with one sinner, with one person who's an outcast, one person who's rejected uh, the law of God, I can fulfill the mission and the purpose that Jesus has given me. I can be like Jesus by eating with sinners, people that the world may say uh, is not worthy. Now, eventually, Jesus had enough of the Pharisees, and right before he was crucified, he gave this very strong rebuke. The Pharisees had reached a point where they, they weren't turning back. Their hearts were so hard by their traditions that, that Jesus says the temple is desolate. God doesn't dwell in it any longer. You guys have ultimately turned your back on the law of God and the word of God and the heart of God. And he gives some really strong words, not to the broken and the downtrodden, not to the sick who need a doctor, but to the righteous who think they're better than everyone else. If you read the Gospels, you will find Jesus being a whole lot harder and harsher with the Pharisees than with those who recognize that they needed help. And isn't that what we found in Luke 15, 1 and 2? The tax collectors and the sinners are coming to listen to Jesus, but the Pharisees are so stubborn that they're not going to. And so Jesus told the Pharisees ultimately this, because you have failed to understand God's mercy, he says in Matthew 21, 31, truly I say to you that the tax collectors and the prostitutes will inherit the kingdom of God before you. Think about that. The people who are the lowest of the low will actually inherit God's kingdom before you, Pharisees. He said in Matthew chapter 23, verses 27 and 28, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs which are on the outside. You appear beautiful. You look the part. You smile. You look like you're righteous. But inside you are full of dead men's bones and unclean. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. That's a pretty strong rebuke. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like a Pharisee. I don't want to accept the mercy of God, but yet reject mercy to other people. I don't want to judge, as one of our elders, Ken Moore, says, I don't want to judge more harshly than what Jesus would. And so one of the principles that we can carry with us in 2018 as we go through this share series is share a meal with someone. Eat with sinners. Fellowship with those who are rejected and outcast. But Jesus did much more than just rebuke the Pharisees. He gave us a glimpse of the heart of God, the great love that God has for people who have gone astray. And so that should be our attitude as well. If that's how Jesus approached the broken and, and the downtrodden, that's how we should approach the broken and the downtrodden. And so I'd like to leave you with four things that you can do in eating with sinners. Number one, a lesson to be learned from this parable is the importance of ridding ourselves of the hypocrisy. To be a hypocrite means to judge according to a law, but not hold your own self accountable to that law. Jesus says, how you will be judged, how you judge others, is how I will judge you. And so we can't be hypocrites in the way that we do life. We must deal with sinners admitting we are a sinner. And so say you sit down and you talk with someone, and they don't know about Jesus. You should share in your weaknesses. Say, yeah, look, man, I mess up too. I made mistakes, but I've got God's grace. I've got God's mercy, and he wants better from us. And God loves us. That's one of the things that we should do. Rid ourselves of the hypocrisy. And if we're actually honest, 
if you actually read the New Testament when it comes to associating and not associating with people, the Bible actually says those who claim the name of Christ but live a completely worldly lifestyle are the people you should stay away from. Isn't that funny? It's not the prostitutes. It's not the drug addicts. It's not the homeless. It is those who bear the name of Jesus but yet don't follow through with the way that Jesus did things. Let me give you an example. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes to this church at Corinth, and he says, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. And then look at this. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin, or who are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, or is greedy, or worships idols, or is abusive, or a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such a person. And so if we are going to rid ourselves of the hypocrisy, uh, of the self-righteousness, we need to admit, look, I mess up, I make mistakes, but I'm not going to disassociate myself from somebody that Jesus wants me to reach. And remember, Jesus' point of associating himself with sinners was not recreation, but repentance. And that must be our goal as well. Number two, a lesson to be learned from this parable is not only did Jesus rid himself of hypocrisy, but he recognized that people are sinners. And that's what we should do as well. The Apostle Paul, who was one of the giants of the Christian faith, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, he wrote this to Timothy a few years before he died. He said in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this is a trustworthy saying, worthy of full acceptance. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. What a humble thing to say. I was at a revival a few years ago. Every once in a while, uh, you know, you go to a Christian church or a revival, and we're all imperfect, we all make mistakes. And sometimes we get really fired up and really excited about a topic but our emotions can override what the Bible actually says. And you often hear this phrase, uh, God loves the sinner but not the sin, right? God hates the sin but not the sinner. And so one of the objectives of this sermon, of uh, th this, this gentleman, was that God hates both the sinner and the sin. That God hates you because you're a sinner. And that you aren't loved by God. And that you need to repent. And I think he went way too far on the other side of the pendulum. Uh, he swung it way too far in the opposite direction. And sometimes we can get caught up in catchy phrases and words and ideas. But here's the bad news. If God hates sinners, and the Apostle Paul is a sinner, and you and I are a sinner, we are in big trouble. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If God hates us, we are in big trouble. And yes, God hates our sin. And yes, we are enemies of God when we live in sin. But the Bible says God loves us so much that he was willing to substitute himself for us, that he was willing to take the punishment of our sin and our penalty in order to make us righteous. And if we could all stand on the same side, it's like if you've got two big circles, or if everyone's divided up in half of the room. You've got Jesus on one side, who is sinless, and everyone else. Me, you, anybody. We all make mistakes. We are all sinners. And so we not only need to rid ourselves of hypocrisy, but we need to remember and recognize that we are sinners. Now in the Bible, there is this principle of association, right? What does light uh, have to do with darkness? Bad company corrupts good character. And it actually says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Paul says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? When it comes to this yoke, this bond, marriage, business transactions, when it comes to this yoke that you have with other people, the Bible says, don't, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a Bible principle that's true. But separation does not mean isolation. And this is where those who are Amish, this is where those who are Mennonites, this is where they've taken it to the ultimate extreme that they believe the Bible teaches isolation rather than separation. And so here's the idea. You fellowship with someone to the point of leading them to repentance. You are the influencer. You are not the influencee. You're the one creating life change. You're not the one who is being changed by being led into sin. And so we have to rid ourselves of hypocrisy. We have to get rid of this idea that we should be isolated. I really like how the Apostle Paul put it in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all men... 
I have made myself a slave to all so that I may win more. What was Jesus' point of fellowshipping with sinners? Repentance. What was Paul's point of fellowshipping with sinners? Winning them to Jesus. He says, to the Jews I became a Jew so that I might, that I might win the Jews. And to those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. Paul would actually keep the Sabbath day on Saturday. He would go into the temple and he would preach the gospel. He would do the same thing on Sunday morning, but he lived like he was a Jew so that he could win the Jews. That was the whole point. But not just the Jews. He also did it for the Gentiles. He says in verse 21, to those who are without the law, I lived as without the law. Very important though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without the law. He says, I went so far, but I didn't violate God's word. I didn't disobey Jesus' command. And I completely disagree with Christians who want to go to the bar and drink with the drunks in order to win the drunks. That simply does not work. That's taking it way too far than what it was meant to be taken. So we must have a line in the sand. We should influence people in such a way that brings them closer to God without disobeying God's law, without rejecting the law of Christ. That is our mission. That is our purpose. That was Jesus' purpose. He, Paul says in verse 22, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that I might mean save some. And look what he says, this beautiful passage. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. My mission is to win people to Jesus, and I will sincerely and fiercely love and fellowship and sacrifice for others. I will become like them to win them without disobeying Jesus. That's incredible. That's what we should strive for. Friends, I want you to eat this year. I want you to have people in your home. One of the goals that I'm setting out for our church this year is that once a quarter, once every three months, every single family in this room would have a new person that doesn't come to church in your home and just eat with them. Share life with them. I plan on doing it, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing. That's only four times a year. And ladies, if you like to plan, you can plan that out, right? Four times a year, once every three months, fellowship and eat with sinners. Go out to lunch. Have them in your home. Bring them lunch one day. I don't care what it is. Eat vegetables. Have a hamburger. Just eat with somebody. Share life with them. Do what Jesus did. Thirdly, we need to realize the importance of God's love for the lost. And that's the beautiful illustration of this parable. Is that here you have this sheep who has wandered away from the flock. He's off in the mountains. He's broken. He's, a, he's alone. He's being hunted by wolves. And you got the shepherd that says, hold on, sheep, I'm going after the one that is lost. That is God's picture of how he approaches us. That's how God feels about you. God's not going to give up on you. God's not going to turn his back on you. Maybe you've wandered away. Maybe today is your way of saying, you know what? I'm going to get myself back on track. I'm going to start reading my Bible every day. I'm going to start praying to God. I'm going to get myself back into church. You need to know that God has been passionately pursuing you, even while you are far away. And even if you don't come back the rest of this year, God is a shepherd who's going to search for you until you die or the end of the world. God loves you. He is passionate about having a relationship with you. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. John chapter 3, verse 17 says, for God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. We need to realize God's love for the lost, and we need to have that same kind of love for other people. And then fourthly and finally, we need to realize not just how God feels, but we need to realize the importance of reaching the lost. That it can't just stop with us saying, yeah, God loves them. Yeah, God loves me. But never leads to any action. Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews or Greeks or the church of God. And even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. I want you to eat this year. And I want you to love people who don't come to church. I want you to fellowship with people who look dark, 
who may be broken or the outcasts of our society and fellowship with them in such a way with the point not of recreation, not just to have fun and spend time with them, but to lead them to repentance as you walk yourself closer towards repentance. We are in this together. And the way that you can change your life for 2018 is by sharing a meal with someone. And you will be blown away by how just taking one day, one evening, one hour, spending it with someone who is broken and downtrodden will change your life and will change theirs. That's what I want to encourage you to do. And I am so glad that Jesus chose to eat, uh, eat with sinners, aren't you? I am really glad that Jesus eats with a sinner every Lord's Day, and that is me. We had the opportunity to take the Lord's Supper. We broke bread and we drank the cup, the fruit of the vine. And Jesus says, I'm going to eat that with you in my Father's kingdom. And so if you want to eat with Jesus, you have the opportunity to do that. To take the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, to fellowship with him and to follow him. I hope that you're encouraged to eat today. I hope that you're encouraged to eat with somebody that's a sinner. And I hope that you're encouraged to eat with Jesus every day as you focus on the word of God and as you share the gospel with other people. Will you stand and pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his love and his grace, his mercy, his kindness. God, I, I pray that we'll all be humbled in such a way that we'll realize that we are sinners in need of a savior. We need grace. We need your mercy, Lord. God, I pray that we'll be willing to share our lives with other people this year, that we'll break outside of our comfort zones, that we'll sacrifice our time and our money for the sake of changing the world for you. We love you, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.